This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, if you know Dr. Guido Halsman, he tells us that while it's possible to read everything Mises ever wrote, it's almost impossible to read everything Rothbard ever wrote. And even today, in 2018, we are still opening boxes full of Murray Rothbard's personal letters, book reviews, editorials, you name it. And as a result of all of this, of course, our one of our resident scholars over the summer, Patrick Newman, was able to put together the Progressive Era book by Murray Rothbard, which we released last year. But there's still more coming. A fifth volume of Rothbard's Conceived in Liberty, which is his epic history of colonial America, is being edited by Patrick even as we speak. So there's still new Rothbard being released. And so Patrick gave a talk at our recent supporters event on just the sheer output and relevance of Rothbard, even still today, almost a quarter century after he's gone. So you'll enjoy this talk from a real up-and-coming Rothbardian, Patrick Newman. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for, uh, for being here. Um, so the title of my talk is Murray Rothbard in the 21st Century. And one thing I'll just note, sort of to tie in with uh, Peter's uh, discussion, was that Rothbard, if you didn't know, was a very low-tech person. So he uh, always used a typewriter, uh, even till the very end. He sort of clinged to his old-fashioned typewriter. And I can only imagine if he was giving this, if he was giving Peter's talk, he would have a little bit more emphasis because not only are these companies very anti-free market, but I still can't imagine Rothbard with an iPhone or you know going on Facebook or something. I could see him still around. He would type up a Mises Daily on a typewriter, and, and he would give it to someone here, and they would have to uh, type it up. Uh, so at least that's uh, an interesting point. So uh, in this talk, I'm, you know, we all know Mary Rothbard, enormously influential Austrian economist, uh, libertarian scholar. Uh, you know, he wrote in the 1950s, the 1960s, you know, all the way up into his untimely death in the uh, mid 1990s, 1995. And, you know, really talk about one, you know, the 21st century, you know, how is an author who wrote a lot of his work 30, 60 years ago, how is he still relevant? You know, why is he still relevant? Why should people still read Rothbard? And how does his work still have this sort of this timeless message? Um, and, you know, I'll be, I'll be talking a little bit how this relates to sort of the works I discussed earlier, the progressive era in the fifth volume of Conceived in Liberty. Uh, as I said, I don't want to give too much information about those because then no one will buy the works. So I have to, you know, keep everyone just always wanting a little bit more. Uh, so one of the things I'll first do is talk about some of his work that is actually still cited, uh, not only by, you might say, Austrian economists or libertarians, but even sort of mainstream scholars. So a lot of people sort of poo-poo Rothbard. They say, oh, you know, yeah, he was very smart, but, you know, he, he made choices and then none of his work, you know, it, it didn't have the impact and uh, it, it sort of sunk into oblivion. And while it is true that he hasn't been, you know, given his, his sort of his just rewards and properly cited, some of his work actually still is uh, very influential and uh, is very significant. Um, one of them that I'll mention is uh, actually his dissertation, which is the Panic of 1819, uh, Reactions and Policies. So he wrote this dissertation in the 50s. Uh, he got his PhD at Columbia University. He defended in 56. And the book was published in 62. And this is still, it's actually quite remarkable, it's still sort of an undisputed reference book on the Panic of 1819. So if you look at authoritative uh, works on history or economic history, uh, and they're talking about the panic, nine times out of 10, Rothbard is always cited. So whenever I look, I, I look in the, you know, the bibliography at the back and I see Rothbard, Panic of 1819, I go, all right, you know, there we go, we got a win. And uh, so just as at least you know, a couple examples, the Oxford History of the United States, sort of a multi-volume series, uh, one of the works on Jacksonian America uh, by Daniel Walker Ho, What uh, Half God Wrought, which came out in 2007, uses Rothbard's book, so it cites Rothbard's book. Uh, a book more on monetary history by two economic historians, Charles Calamiris and Stephen Haber, Fragile by Design, came out in 2014, and they cite Rothbard's book on the Panic of 1819. And actually, recently, someone just contacted the Mises Institute. Uh, they have a podcast on Jacksonian America, it's sort of affiliated with Stanford University, and they asked if someone could speak about it. And I'll be speaking about the, the dissertation, hopefully, in a, in a week or two. It's called The Age of, uh, of Jackson. And I mean, it's actually quite remarkable. Someone's dissertation writ written 50 plus years ago is still 
uh, people still want to talk about it and people still actually read it. You know, I have enough trouble getting people to read my dissertation and I wrote mine three years ago. You know, so actually, you know, when I teach class and, you know, on my syllabi, I say if I catch students cheating, I don't fail them. I just have to make the write a book review on my dissertation and, and no one cheats in my class. Uh, you know, I gave a copy to my dad and I asked him, you know, if he's ready. He says he keeps it right by his bedstand. So if he has trouble going to sleep, he opens it up, knocks him right out. He's on page three right now and I did give him two years ago. So anyway, I mean, as a, as a side point, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's actually very interesting that his dissertation is still read and it's still used. I mean, that really shows, and you look, he was very influential in the primary sources. He was a true historian in that sense. Uh, and to do that for your first work into something that you didn't even really use that much before really just shows how much of a polymath and how skilled he was. The second work, uh, just briefly sort of mentioned, that is still gets occasional references. It might not be as approving, but it's still cited as sort of the Austrian uh, uh, reference on the, on, the, on the episode, was America's Great Depression, which he wrote uh, really in the mid-50s, about 56 to 57, and then it came out in 1963. And uh, the much more famous Friedman and Schwartz volume, A Monetary History of the United States, came out the same year, was certainly more influential, but it's still, you know, heartening to know that occasionally Rothbard gets citations by mainstream scholars uh, on, you know, sort of the Austrian discussion of the issue, and sometimes even approvingly when they have a pro-credit expansion, uh, you know, causing the uh, initial, uh, the cause of the Great Depression. So as an example, there was a, an article that came out in the Journal of Macroeconomics just two years ago on a new history of banking panics in the United States by uh, Andrew uh, J Jalil. And uh, he cites Rothbard as sort of the you know, authoritative analysis, just a brief mention. But I mean, you know, you'll take it when you can get it, getting Rothbard in the Journal of Macroeconomics. And uh, then a, for any of you who know Barry Eichengreen, who wrote a famous book, Golden Fetters, sort of a well-known Keynesian economist, uh, he had an article that was published in an economic history volume uh, with Chris Michener on uh, credit expansions as, as a, the Great Depression, excuse me, as a, as a uh, credit boom gone wrong. And he actually takes sort of a pro, the Federal Reserve had you know, easy monetary policy in the 1920s, and that contributed to the Great Depression. He takes a very sort of Keynesian view of the Great Depression, but again, still cites Rothbard, and it's still, you know, at least for the 1920s, uh, you know, bubble, and, you know, it's still heartening to know, again, in the 21st century, not only by Austrians or libertarians, but also by, you know, mainstream scholars, Rothbard's work that was cited, you know, that's written 50 plus years ago is still cited. So, you know, that's still, uh, you know, it's still good to know, and it just shows the significance of him as an author. Uh, so sort of, you know, moving on aside from those, you know, listing some of his work that's been, you know, in, in, important, you know, what is actually, you know, sort of the, the importance of his writing? So why should people still read his, his, his work and people still do read his work just from laymen, just, you know, getting into uh, economics or political philosophy or even uh, scholars later on? Uh, I mean, this is something that's important because especially now science is becoming increasingly, uh, at least economics, where if an article is written five or 10 years ago, it's out of date. It's no longer got the most you know, up to date literature citations or methodology. So it's, you know, just put it in the dustbin. But, you know, why should people and why do people still read Rothbard? Well, the first thing is that Rothbard was a great writer. Uh, he was very clear. He was concise. Most academics are terrible writers. Uh, you know, reading a lot of academic work is kind of like passing a kidney stone. It's very painful. You sort of force yourself to do it. You go, oh, you know, it's just this, it's this bad process. And on the other hand, Rothbard, he can really make the most uninteresting subject interesting, where he can, he can make it funny. He can emphasize the points. He can drive it home. He uses italics, which is great. Uh, so he knows how to emphasize points. Um, he's entertaining. And it's someone that, regardless of the work that you, you read of him, you know, a layman can understand it, uh, you know, a you know, young scholar can understand it, as well as a technical scholar. So, you know, for example, uh, you know, we'll talk about a little bit, you know, man economy and state has this importance. Uh, you know, as an example, Rothbard also just his ports of a writing. I mean, just if you read it, you'll, you'll learn all these great phrases and great illustrative ways to describe things. One of my favorite Rothbardian phrases is, architectonic edifice, or sort of this, this structural, systematic, you know, building block for something. So I've always tried to use architectonic edifice 
uh, you know, in, in, you know, when I write or, you know, just, you know, I, I, I encourage you to try in your daily life to even use architectonic edifice one time. You say, you know, let's say you make breakfast. You know, I had, went to the buffet today at the hotel and I had this architectonic edifice of breakfast. I had, you know, sausage and bacon and eggs and toast and cereal and then strawberries. And the best part was I didn't have to clean any of it up, which is, you know, which is great for me. Um, another great word for him is, is scintillating. He uses, you know, describe, you know, he says something scintillating. And I remember presenting a paper one time and, and someone commented because I had a I had a block quote from Rothbard and I said, you know, Rothbard scintillatingly describes something, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and someone said, well, you know, well, you know, you really shouldn't, you know, it's something not scintillating, blah, blah, And I immediately interject and I say, how is it not scintillating? It's brilliant. And then, you know, everyone laughed and I, you know, I said, well, I'm going to use the word, you know, it's very illuminating. It, you know, there's nothing wrong with using sort of, you know, value laden terms when it's, you know, you, you want to emphasize something. And that's something Rothbard did. And, you know, that's, again, it's just help you be a better writer. And it's still very uh, important conveying ideas. Talk more about the ideas. Uh, so with man, economy, and state, at least, uh, it truly is an architectonic edifice of economics. And it's, <laughs> see, I, I did use it once. And uh, it is something that, again, a layman can read it, as well as a person. I've, man, economy, and state, one of the most influential books, probably the most influential book, I've read, I still open it up and I still find gems of insight. And I still deal with all of Rothbard's books. And uh, again, it's, it's an economic book. It was written in the 1950s. And the fact that still people read it, again, most economics books, most papers, no one reads them. You look at the, you know, the count, it goes into a journal. And then maybe you're lucky if you get, you know, 10, you know, oh my God, someone downloaded my paper. All right, well, that's, that's two for this year. You know, that, 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 that's how bad it gets sometimes. Um, at least sort of turning to the economic history, sort of talk a little bit about the influence of the two books I mentioned from before. You know, why are they still important? So you think of the progressive era. It's about period, you know, roughly over 100 years ago. Rothbard wrote it in the 1970s. Uh, you know, why is it still important? Is it just history for its own sake or does it actually have lessons about today? Well, as Peter described, you know, Rothbard really sort of goes into the emergence of the modern sort of what's known as the alliance of throne and altar. So you have the alliance basically of, of you know, big government, big business, big intellectuals, and big unions. So if you think today, and Peter went through this with a lot of the tech companies, sort of these very sort of favored businesses, uh, and also various Wall Street firms, they, they donate heavily to sort of various political parties. They always seem to have the appropriate, they're so large, they can handle the regulations, the compliance costs don't hit them as well. Uh, you have the big intellectuals, so, you know, the Ivy Leagues, uh, the, the favored news networks that, you know, people consider reliable. So CNN, the New York Times, the Washington Post, MSNBC, where if you, if you disagree with those, where you're just biased, et cetera, they're the ones really conveying the truth. Uh, and then big government where, you know, you have the Democrats and the Republicans, just sort of the whole beltway, uh, which is really protective of its, uh, of its power and sort of the pelf it has over. That's another great Rothbard word, pelf. If you want to describe the government taking something, you know, they take, you know, the power and pelf, you know, they're just a bunch of looters, basically, uh, you know, the gang writ large, you know, gang of thieves writ large. Um, and Rothbard sort of goes into this, you know, how this, how this developed, you know, how this sort of modern, you know, corporatism came into being. It just didn't happen out of nowhere. It didn't begin with the Reagan tax cuts in the 1980s, despite, you know, what Piketty says or something about that. Uh, you know, it was around for a lot longer uh, before then. And, you know, at least to go briefly into sort of, you know, conceived in Liberty Volume 5, so then you go, okay, even farther back, why does something about the, the 1780s still have, have relevance today? So, you know, at least from one perspective, you know, Rothbard tells a story about the, the founding of the, uh, you know, of, of America's Constitution. And it's something I mentioned before. He really tries to hammer home the point that a lot of people today still, they, you know, they find it very uncomfortable to believe, but that the state is a coercive entity. It's not a social contract. It's not a unanimous social contract where outside of its anarchy and then people sort of voluntary, voluntarily sacrifice some of their rights. Uh, you know, it really is sort of a coercive theory and, and states emerge through conquest. And he goes through the process of basically how the United States, um, you know, how the Constitution was formed and how a lot of the state ratifying conventions, really a majority of the people didn't want it, but do the various reasons, sort of delegates switching sides, uh, media propaganda, which I'll get into more. Or even in cases outright coercion, the states sort of join the union. 
Uh, one of the most fascinating cases, this sort of gets, we talk about trade retaliation yesterday. Lou Rockwell, Ron Paul talked about this, was that um, you know, after George Washington became president, two states were still holding out. It was North Carolina and it was Rhode, it was Rhode Island. And little, little Rhode Island was the last state. It, was the, it held out until the very bitter end. And it just so, you know, you know the, the, the government, the United States said, well, we might just have to take them over if they don't join. And at one point when the, the ratifying convention was going on in Rhode Island, uh, in the Senate, a bill basically was passed that was going to enact retaliatory trade legislation against Rhode Island. If they didn't join, they wouldn't be allowed to become a free trade zone. So it was total, basically, embargo, shut them down. And, you know, it was really just sort of a threat. And even then, despite that, Rhode Island barely ratified by two delegate votes, 34 to 32. It was just, you know, really out into the bitter end, they're going to they're gonna hold on, which is, you know, as Rothbard would say, it was heroic. You know, it was, it was the last stand. You know, it's great forces of liberalism, you know, and... Um, and, you know, so again, just little Rhode Island had, you know, had that tenacity. Uh, one other thing that we can sort of learn from the period that Rothbard goes through that I was sort of heartened to, uh, to find, you know, to read, you know, Rothbard's work is that, you know, this isn't the only time the media has been very biased in favor of big government. One of the, advantage of the advantages of the Federalist forces during the ratification of the Constitution is that they really had control of the press. They had control of the press. And more importantly, despite really no one using it now, they had control of the post office, which is very important, where a lot of the postmaster generals were, uh, were heavily uh, Federalist. And so the Federalists had greater communication. They were able to uh, you know, propagandize much more. Uh, they would sometimes only list you know, pro-Federalist uh, articles in newspapers. If newspapers issued anti-federal articles, people would stop their subscriptions. They'd get threats. Sometimes the newspaper buildings would be ransacked. I mean, that's one way of persuading them to stop, basically. Um, and, you know, to, to really uh, sort of, you know, drive that, drive that point home, uh, it, it wasn't sort of a, 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 fair, a fair match. And, uh, it, you know, it's quite interesting. You know, you look at uh, just coincidentally, uh, some uh, Federalist mail was delivered in the span of one to two weeks by while other federal anti-Federalist mail was took months to deliver. So you go like, oh, okay, like uh, maybe, you know, something's going on. Yeah, and so in a sense, you know, with Google or other, you know, okay, having favored searches or when you type something into favored website, oh, you get a totally different perspective. Uh, at least now, you know, it's a lot easier to convey information. You know, before you only had newspapers or pamphlets and it was a lot harder. So it's interesting to note that the media has always been an instrument, basically, of propaganda for uh, big government. It's always been basically pushing that. It was something sort of a, a theme you sort of read in Rothbard. He was talking about that, you know, the deck has always sort of been uh, somewhat stacked uh, against us, you know, in that, uh, you know, interesting, um, uh, you know, sort of the I interesting view. Uh, one last point that I'll mention is sort of a, another project involving the Rothbard archives, uh, working on with Joe Salerno. Sort of, there was an, er, a book that came out a couple years ago called Strictly Confidential and had some of Rothbard's, uh, writings on, you know, uh, when he was for the Volcker Fund about economics, political, uh, philosophy, but, you know, political science history. We're working on sort of another volume that sort of has more of Rothbard's economic writings. A lot of stuff that you'd work, you'd, you know, we'd write uh, reviews of essays or books and some of these even book reviews and it'd be very lengthy and he'd have citations, everything there, you know, very in-depth. Uh, he was you know, sort of a true scholar in that sense. And that one, you know, even so, even though these articles might be 50 plus years old, 60 years old, uh, there's still, you know, he's talking about something of business, you know, some guy writing an article on predatory pricing or monopoly. And it's still the same themes that you see today. That, oh, okay, you know, you know, this is why this person's right or this is why this person's wrong. And again, he has, he has he's such a way of writing that you actually want to read these articles if you haven't already read them, you know, even though they're 60 plus years old, just because you say, wow, you know, he's talking about all this stuff or I want to look at, you know, the footnotes, et cetera. So, you know, really, you know, in conclusion, you know, Rothbard, despite, you know, again, he, he died over 20 years ago, most of his writing, you know, is, again, 30, 60 years old, it's still extremely relevant. It still shows, you know, a great writer. Uh, he still gets some citations, obviously by Austrians and libertarians, but also by mainstream scholars. And he still, the, the ideas he talks about has enormous influence and they're, you know, they're very inspirational. Uh, and so this is basically why you should all read Rothbard. Uh, thank you very much. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.